Welcome to the book of Hosea. Man, it is amazing the lengths that God goes to get his people's attention, isn't it? He tells Ezekiel, man, buddy, your wife is going to die as a sign to Israel. And then he's going to tell Jeremiah, hey, you are not allowed to get married as a sign to Israel. He's going to tell Hosea to marry a prostitute. Now, of course, God speaks to Hosea long before he spoke to Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Um, however, both Jeremiah and our buddy Hosea are what are called deathbed prophets. Jeremiah ministered to Judah in the final years before that nation um, was to be hauled off into exile uh, in Babylon in 586. And Hosea ministered to uh, the northern tribes of Israel in their final years before they are taken to Assyria in 722. It is kind of curious, however, that the opening verse of the book mentions four kings of Judah and only one king of Israel. Look at this. So here we have, the word of the Lord came to Hosea in the days of um, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, um, and in the days of Jeroboam, only king of Israel. Now, if our buddy Hosea ministered through the reign or up to the reign of Hezekiah, then he will have seen the coming and going of seven kings of Israel. Look at this. Here is a massive timeline of the kings of Judah here on the left and the kings of Israel on the right. Um, if we recall that Hosea, here he is, ministered to Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, um, and also Jeroboam of Israel, well, then he would have seen uh, the coming and going of all of these kings. Gosh, this is so small, because Zechariah, Shalom, and Pekahiah, they only uh, reigned for six months, one month, and two years. Short reigns there. Um, <clears throat> well, the content of the book of Hosea also seems to speak to a northern audience as opposed to a southern audience uh, of Judah. Um, what was uh, Israel's first king's primary sin? Uh, you, you remember his name is also Jeroboam. Um, and the, the sin of Jeroboam, which is repeated by every subsequent king of Israel uh, in first and second kings, is the establishment of two rival temples in, uh, in the north, one at Bethel and one at Dan, with a golden calf at each of them. And Hosea is going to condemn this specific um, uh, golden calf several times in his book. Take a look at this. So again, we're trying to um, isolate the specific audience for this book. Who is Hosea ministering to? Who is he talking to? I have spurned your calf. O Samaria, for a craftsman made it the calf of Samaria. 10.5, the inhabitants of Samaria tremble because the calf of um, Bethel, um, <coughs> it will be departed from them and it will be carried off to Assyria. Now, of course, Assyria isn't the main threat of Judah in the south. Um, their their uh, primary villain is uh, an adversary is Babylon, but uh, Assyria is the nation that takes Israel into captivity. Um, if we go down to chapter uh, 11, we see this same thing. They shall not return to the land of Egypt in verse 5, but Assyria will be their king. Again, we're talking about um, Israel here, <clears throat> the northern tribes, like doves from the land of Assyria. That's where they're going to be taken before they will uh be returned. Now, this has led some to believe that Hosea's original spoken oracles, um, which he spoke to uh, Israel in the north, when they were transcribed and became written oracles, uh, they were adapted so as to speak to and apply to both Israel and Judah. Um, and you can see there's a couple of places where it looks like maybe an editorial hand kind of added Judah in or or isolates uh, Judah in a special way. Look at this. It's kind of curious. If we go over here. Um, Judah and Israel are set in a parallel relationship several times. 
um, <clears throat> where it says something like, Israel has forgotten its maker and built pa uh, palaces, and Judah also has multiplied fortified cities, kind of set in a, a parallel relationship. But in other instances, Judah is, is set aside in a unique way. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in his guilt. Judah also shall stumble with him. See that? Um, the house of Israel has seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's whoredom is there. Israel is defiled. For you also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed. And then there's a couple of times where Judah is isolated um, for a positive treatment, where it says, um, you know, Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah still walks with God and is faithful to the Holy One. <clears throat> and then if we are to look at the, the final verse of the book, chapter 14, verse 9, it seems as if this particular verse is lifted right from the book of Proverbs. It says, whoever is wise, let him understand these things, and whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of Yahweh are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Now, this verse, it kind of stands apart from uh, the rest of chapter 14 and from the entire book of Hosea, um, and it acts almost like an uh, addendum. Uh, authorial addendum or addition to the book, uh, informing us and teaching us how we are to read the whole of Hosea. That's what 14.9 functions as. And I like uh, how a particular scholar, Gerard Shepard, um, explains the function of this verse. Take a look at what he says. All right, Gerard, Gerald, what do you have to say? Well, originally, Hosea prophesied only against the northern kingdom. Yet, the final shape of the book shows many indications that his words were also perhaps later applied to the southern kingdom, um, that they were generalized so as uh, to become relevant to the south as well. And this particular proverb, the last verse of the book, has the effect of relativizing even further the original particularity of the address, um, that particularity being for the, uh, the North specifically. Well, um, as Hosea is the, the first book in what is called the Book of the Twelve, that is the, the Twelve Minor Prophets, um, in the Hebrew tradition, they're all collected together into one scroll. It's called the Book of the Twelve. And it seems as if this first book here, Hosea, is, is teaching us through this final um, <laughs> wisdom saying at the end that, that this book, the book of the 12, is meant for all Israel, Israel and Judah. And their, their primary message is that um, both Israel and Judah will be judged for their covenant unfaithfulness. They'll be hauled off into exile, Israel to Assyria and Judah to Babylon. But one day, God will enable um, hard-hearted Israel to repent from the heart, and they will be restored to the land, placed under a Davidic king, um, where Yahweh will pour his blessings on them. Now, this pattern, this pattern of judgment and uh, restoration is set on repeat in the book of Hosea. <clears throat> so, in the initial three chapters, uh, chapters which focus on the prophet himself, Hosea, and his wife, uh, there are three cycles of judgment. Um, here in chapter 1, and restoration, and then judgment in chapter 2, 2 through 13, and restoration in the second half of that chapter, and then judgment, restoration. And then we see this in the body of the um, book as well, with 4 through 10, judgment, 11, restoration, 12 and 13, judgment, and 14, the final chapter of the book, restoration. Well, let's begin our study of this book by meeting the prophet and his family. Um, let's take a look at the opening verse here, 1 verse 2. Poor Hosea, what a tough job. Um, when the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said to him, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. <clears throat> 
Now, this is the, the dominant metaphor throughout the entirety of the book of Hosea. This word, <coughs> we'll get it over here, um, hordam, uh, zanach, uh, it's repeated at least 19 times throughout the entire book. And the, the concept here is that Israel's spiritual adultery, spiritual idolatry, worshiping other gods, the, the Canaanite god of um, fertility, Baal, um, and others, this is set on analogy with uh, the adultery of um, a faithless wife. Um, <clears throat> now, this only makes sense, this analogy of uh, idolatry as adultery, if we conceive of Israel's covenant with Yahweh as a marriage covenant. Um, so uh, when Israel entered into a covenant with Yahweh at Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 and 24, Effectively, they got married, and then they moved in together when Yahweh set a tabernacle in their midst. However, Israel, um, the bride, was an unfaithful bride. And I think, I think we need to sit with this concept um, of, of, of adultery and marital betrayal for a minute, just so we can sense its weight. Um, what would you say is the most painful experience someone can undergo in this life as, as a human? Um, is it a, a many years long battle with cancer or uh, <clears throat> going through the ordeal of, of bankruptcy, um, uh, financial ruin? I don't think so. Um, our greatest joys in this life and our, most, our deepest wounds come from relationships. Um, the most agonizing trauma that we can experience that we can undergo is, is I think, uh, the betrayal of a loved one. And of course, um, there's no greater loved one and no greater betrayal than, than that in a marriage relationship. And this is the kind of pain that Yahweh felt every day with the nation of Israel. And so he says here in chapter one, I want a divorce. Um, that is effectively what Hosea's three children are meant to communicate um, God wanting a divorce. He says, um, you are to marry a wife of Hordom and have children of Hordom with Gomer. And um, Yahweh gives uh, <coughs> Hosea names that, that he is to uh, name his children. The first is Jezreel. He has a, a boy named Jezreel, which means God will scatter, um, referring, of course, to the exile. And then he has a daughter. And, and uh, Yahweh says, Name your daughter no mercy, for I will not have mercy any longer on the house of Israel. And uh, his, his third child, a boy, his name is not my people. And this is just an undoing of that original covenant formula where God says, you will be my people and I will be your God. Well, here, um, Hosea's third child says, you are not my people. <coughs> um so these names are effectively divorce papers. However, <laughs> however, that's not where the chapter ends. Um, here in uh, <clears throat> the latter verses of chapter one, God says to Hosea, I want you to change your children's name. I want you to rename them. Look at this. All right, one verse 10. <clears throat> Um, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, his, his uh, third son, um, that's his name. Rather, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. Change his name to children of the living God. And then um, your, your daughter um, called No Mercy, I want you to call her name, you have received mercy. Um, now, you may have been an, an unfaithful bride, um, Israel, but I, Yahweh, am a faithful husband, and I will take you back, and I will gather you um, to the land, and when you return to the land, you will appoint for yourself one head. Now, I wonder who that is, I'm thinking it's the Davidic king, um, who uh, <clears throat> we know now as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the second cycle here in this opening section in chapter two, um, it's going to change genre. Uh, we went from narrative here in chapter one. Now we um, have a section of poetry, a poetic oracles in chapter two, and it's going to change the characters as well. We're no longer focusing on Hosea, the prophet, and Gomer, but rather 
Um, we're going to the source, Yahweh, the husband, and Israel, the wife. And the main issue <clears throat> in the, uh, these chap this chapter, chapter two, is who blesses Israel? Is Yahweh the one who blesses his nation Israel? Or um, is it her lovers, um, the, the Canaanite fertility god Baal, or, or some other um, god that they are fornicating with? Um, in verse uh, five of this chapter, Israel says, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread, my water, my wool, my flax, and my oil, and my drink. <clears throat> and then Yahweh, he responds just in total um, exacerbation, saying, she did not know that it was I, he says. It was I who gave her um, the grain, the wine, the oil, uh, the silver, and the gold. And therefore, he's going to respond in judgment because you go after your lovers. Therefore, I will take away uh, her grain and her wine, her oil, and her flax um, in verse 9. And then there's this the chapter actually opens with this devastating conclusion. Look at this in uh, verse 2 of chapter 2. <clears throat> plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, uh, Yahweh says of Israel. However, um, Hosea always pairs judgment with restoration. And it seems like out of nowhere in verse 14, um, look what it says. Look what Yahweh says of his faithless bride, Israel. <clears throat> verse 14, um, you know, right after it says, I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals, her lovers that she went after. Um, in verse 14, therefore, he says, I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. Look at this. This is amazing. Verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. Um, and in that day, you will call me my husband. And, and you will no longer say to me, my Baal. No, you will call me my husband. And in that day, I will lavish my blessings on you again. I will give you um, your vineyards and um, give you the grain and the wine and the oil. <clears throat> well, chapter three is going to return to uh, Hosea and Gomer. Um, their, their broken marriage of chapter one must be restored. So in verse one, um, Yahweh says to Gomer or to Hosea, go and Love again a woman who was loved by another man and is an adulteress. And there's this just this beautiful line where Hosea goes and he he looks for his his wife Gomer and he finds her and he discovers that she has become enslaved to her lovers. Gomer has racked up some debts with all of these these men and she basically has become their slave. And Hosea pays her debts and takes her home. But then there's this curious line, um, we're jumping here now to verse 3, where it says that Gomer must dwell with Hosea for many days. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look at this. This is, this is a, a bit of a mystery. Let's, let's figure this out. So down here in verse chapter 3, <clears throat> um, Yahweh, or um, Hosea, uh, redeems his wife. And then it says, you must dwell as mine, Gomer, for many days. Um, you will not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. What does that mean? I will also be to you uh, in the same nature as um, <coughs> Gomer no longer belonging to another man. And then this statement about Gomer dwelling with um, Hosea for many days is set parallel to this line in verse four, for it says, for the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, ephod or household gods. And this is clearly a reference to the exile where for many days, 
they will dwell outside of the land and not have a king over them and not sacrifice in the temple. They won't be able to because they'll be in Assyria. Um, <clears throat> so how? Uh, what's the relationship between verse 3 and verse 4? Well, it seems possible that this period of time, this um, many days that uh, Gomer dwells with Hosea, um, they... Gomer will be in the same house as Hosea, but it's possible that they won't um, they won't sleep together, kind of in the same way that Israel um, will not worship Yahweh um, <coughs> with uh, with sacrifices at the temple. It, it, it seems like that's a, a possible explanation for this parallel. But then it says, afterwards, after this period of time, your exile, many days afterwards, in verse five. Israel will return to the land and she will seek Yahweh her God and David her king. Amazing. Um, so Hosea, uh, here in chapter three, he anticipates the reunification of Israel and Judah, their return to the land, um, living under a Davidic king, worshiping Yahweh, their husband, at a restored temple in the land. Um, it's really uh, astounding here. These first three chapters in Hosea are amazing. But before Israel can return to the land, she has to leave from the land. And we will discuss that, that captivity, the, the exile, and the reason for it in chapters 4 through 10 and 12 to 13 next. <laughs> 